Mr. Speaker, there's been a slew of U U.S. Supreme Court decisions, like for example, Citizens United, like for example, the Walmart class action civil suit that has seen the increasing empowerment of corporations in our political and in political and public life. And what we've been seeing as a result from this is that they've not only have they been increasingly empowered, but they've been able to flex their financial muscles, muscles to push their own viewpoints through. And then what we suggest on this side is that it usually comes at the expense of individual and democratic rights. We think this has been further exacerbated in light of the kind of interest, in, in light of the interest in movements opposing corporate logic. For example, the increasing movement for climate change and the like, which we think further provokes and spurs them to invest into more think tanks, to further invest into more research institutes, to try and you know, like pervert public perception and public opinion towards supporting their own corporate logic. And we think this is particularly harmful. What we want to do is that we want to ban them from being able to invest in such an independent academic research and we want to maintain and ensure that the dialectical discourse that exists within society remains fair and remains open, that we have the ability and the avenue to reply back against the corporate logic. So what we're going to do, yeah, it's simple enough, we're going to ban them from investing in academic research, we think this is fine, because for these corporations, they still have their own private research departments, which they use to like, research for like, whatever interests or incentives or motives that they have on their own part, but we basically what we want to do, like I said earlier, is maintain the discourse for the benefit and betterment of society. I'm going to talk about a couple of things, right? Firstly, I want to talk about principally why we think this is important and we're going to examine the nature of corporation investment, the nature of academic research and why we think the state has a duty to step in. And next, we're going to talk about why we need to step in to maintain the integrity of the outcome of research in these facilities and why that's necessarily important mm -hmm. for the state. So first, principle. But before that, we need to understand a couple of things. Firstly, we need to understand right, that corporations fight for their own interests interest, and their interests usually end up as being diametrically opposed to the interests of individuals or usually even majoritarian interests. Like, for example, climate change is antithetical to whatever corporations, like, for example, BP, who operate on their conception of trying to exploit more resources for oil, to exploit more technology that sees the detriment of environmental conditions in certain areas in the world. So naturally, if they want to advance their own corporate, corporate logic, it comes at the expense of something else. And we think that something else is usually better for individuals and majority societies. But not just that, right? We've seen how, for example, their increasing influence into, like, for example, think tanks like the Club for Growth, where they have people like, for example, BP and Amway exercising their largesse to influence public opinion and public thought. So we see how eminently political they have been. So we go to the second characterization that we need to look at. What are academic research and why is it so fundamentally important? We think academic research are largely objective pieces of report coming from academic institutions. And we think this is particularly important, right? We give, for example, uh, university professors things like tenure and some kind of protection to ensure the independence and integ integrity of their research. So we use it as a main avenue of opposition to other political viewpoints that may exist in the discourse that underlies society. So we think in that way, like especially since that people resort to academic reports as the primary means of opposing such viewpoints, we think that characterization of academic research is important in us realizing why we need that in the field of discourse. And largely we argue, Mr. Speaker, the third characterization I need to go through is that single donators or people who like extremely rich individuals or like pockets of individuals who want to donate as a counter check or counterbalance against corporate largesse usually doesn't work. Because no matter what you do, the individual will never be able to outspend a corporation. Even if you think like even if you agree that certain individuals are billionaires, the rest of society who have such political motivations usually cannot compete against your BPs, your Mways, and the Goldman Sachs. So there will always remain that kind of like uh, asymmetry that exists in terms of the ability to spend and the ability to influence. Recognizing all three, so we see what kind of discourse we're facing in society right now, and we think that the state has a very important duty to step in and protect the people from such insidious elements, especially since we're talking about discourse, where the effects and the nature of discourse is largely invisible to the common man, we think there's further incentive upon the state to step in and protect them. We don't think this is anything different. For example, we institute financial regulations to fetter corporations, preventing them from like, perverting financial and economic markets to protect the people at the end of the day. The principle similarly applies here. There is an inherent duty and we're fulfilling it on this side. So why must the state step in? And I have four reasons why they must step in. Firstly, we think that the state, on the back of the earlier analysis, has a motivation and has an interest to advance human knowledge and try as far as possible to push through different viewpoints in the hope that in the collision of different viewpoints, we reach the kind of median of consensus that will help us improve further. But what happens right, when you allow corporations to invest their massive wealth into the kind of academic <coughs> research is that you turn away other people from similarly this, like they're donating into these independent think tanks, independent researchers, and we think this is fundamentally detrimental because you shut down all other avenues. 
when a person realizes that she's competing against Goldman Sachs and he knows for a fact that he cannot compete with them on a financial basis, it pushes and deters them away from even wanting to donate in the first place. So the natural cascading effect of this, Mr. Speaker, is that you see the systematic shutdown of all other forms of avenues of discourse or all other forms of antithetical and antithetical opinion that exist within society. And we think this is particularly harmful. Even in those areas that do exist, the small think tanks that will inevitably sprout out, we think they will do nothing and be powerless against against the economic might of these corporations. So we think that's especially important. <coughs> Secondly, Mr. Speaker, we think what you basically do is that you give these corporations the sheen of respectability that comes only with the, the, the masquerade that like, you know, these in the, in the independent academic researchers bring. Let's be clear, right? Nobody researches into who exactly funds think tanks or funds individual academic researchers. So that's largely invisible to people and people will never have access to such information. Something that will be further exacerbated when you allow corporations to come in and further shield this away from any form of inquiry. And why is this important? Because as they push through such like uh, antithetical opinions to majoritarian interests, and they use the sheer respectability that comes from think tanks or researchers like RAND, for example, we think this pushes their message and people are blind to the fact that these were corporate-sponsored viewpoints, that these were corporate-sponsored projects. And what happens is that people buy into the respectability. We don't want that, Mr. Speaker, because we think that when it comes to political and political discourse in society, everybody reserves the right to know what kind of viewpoint that is, and we want to expose that for what it is. Now, the third point, Mr. Speaker, the benefits of free market logic and why that will be pilfered when you push through your policy. We need to understand one thing, like, for example, we think lots of good has come from like, independent research and open source collection of information. Like, if we talk about the pharmaceutical industry, because of copyright laws, what we see in most academic researchers in most universities is that they rely on open source logic and open source contribution to push through like, beneficial returns and outcomes from their research. What you basically then happen is that when you open up the floodgates and you tear down the walls of regulation, you allow corporations to dip their finger into almost every pot of research or every possible conduit for research that is out there. You effectively take out these kind of institutions, you take out these kind of platforms which allow for open source collective like a collection of information which we think is fundamentally beneficial. Because to them, these are pockets of opposition to the corporate logic that sees them benefit and they're not going to allow it and they're going to use the economic wealth that they have to guarantee their economic success. So we think it's detriment, particularly detrimental as well. And the last point, Mr. Speaker, we think what's particularly dangerous about the corporate logic is that it's extremely myopic. In the sense that even though we all believe that an alternative form of like fuel is important to like further help us all out in the long run, for companies like BP who have the money, that is fundamentally dangerous to what they think is good for them. Because they want they care about their quarterly profits, they care about the profits that they're gonna get in the next couple of years. And for them, such forms of research into things that will be beneficial in the long run are fundamentally fatal to their own profit logic. And we think this will be similarly shut down as well. For these reasons, Mr. Speaker, this important logic must stand.